The Spread of Dispensationalism It should be noted that the 19th century was the era of the printed word in the same way that the 20th century has been the era of radio and television. Darby was a master of that medium. He was not only a prolific writer himself, he constantly urged other brethren leaders who agreed with him to write and publish as well. He encouraged those who didn't write to print and distribute what other brethren had written. Consequently, during the last half of the 19th century, the leaders of the Brethren movement had an influence in the evangelical Protestant church that went far beyond what one would ordinarily expect of such a small group of men. As a result of the recognition they gained among ministers who read their books and articles, Darby and his disciples, men like William Kelly, C. H. McIntosh, and William Trotter, gained access to the pulpit in various denominations. Once there, they preached the prophetic understanding of the scriptures that had originated with John Darby. As Darby's prophetic views became more widely accepted, Darby himself came to have greater influence in other denominations. But few ministers were willing to openly admit their association with him or even to acknowledge their indebtedness to Darby and his disciples. That's understandable. The Plymouth Brethren carried a definite stigma because they did not have their own spiritual house in order. Again, that was the result of Darby's submission to Satan's leading. After Newton disputed Darby's any-moment view of the rapture, the two had a series of nasty exchanges and then parted company. Shortly thereafter, Darby formed the Exclusive Brethren. These folks tried to maintain the ostensible purity of their sect by refusing to fellowship with anyone who failed to maintain doctrinal unity. The net result of this practice, however, was the expulsion of anyone who disagreed with Darby on any issue. That served Satan's purposes quite nicely. It provided a way for him to protect and preserve his lie, while brethren leaders promoted it throughout the church. James H. Brooks was one of the ministers who was reticent to acknowledge his indebtedness to the brethren. From 1864 to 1897, he served as pastor at two large Presbyterian churches in St. Louis, Missouri. Interestingly enough, over that period, he illogically combined the basic premise behind John Calvin's covenant theology with the distinction that Darby drew between Israel and the church. Moreover, the historical evidence indicates James H. Brooks remained completely dedicated to Satan's doctrine until the day he died. Satan must have found it a delicious irony that he could blind a Presbyterian to the point where he could not see the disparate nature of his own beliefs. In December 1874, Brooks began publishing a monthly periodical titled The Truth, and in spite of his reluctance to publicly acknowledge his indebtedness to the Brethren, he regularly published articles in The Truth that were written by Brethren writers like H. H. Snell, George F. Trench, John R. Caldwell, and William Lincoln. Moreover, Brooks repeatedly used his position as editor of The Truth to recommend things written by Brethren authors in England. Thus, a strong case can be made that he most likely derived his dispensational views from reading what Darby and his followers had written. That is important only because some dispensationalists today would prefer to trace their roots only as far back as Brooks rather than all the way back to Darby. One can easily understand why. Not everyone holds Darby in the same high esteem that Brooks did. A university graduate and for years a clergyman, he was remarkable for his literary acquirements. Those who sneer at him because he belonged to the Plymouth Brethren little dream that he surpassed them in scholarship as far as a giant surpasses a baby in strength. It sounds to me like Brooks had also fallen under Darby's spell. That is not surprising inasmuch as he had plenty of opportunity. Darby preached from his pulpit on more than one occasion, so it doesn't matter much whether or not dispensationalists are willing to admit Brooks got his ideas directly from Darby. The evidence clearly indicates he had read Darby's books and accepted his dispensational ideas. As a matter of fact, 
Satan had reasons for Brooks hiding his indebtedness to Brethren writers. He wanted to, and did, use Brooks to ensure that Darby's deception was finally cut free from its identification as a Plymouth Brethren doctrine. The vehicle Brooks used as a cover for Satan's lie was the Niagara Bible Conference.